please turn your Bibles to the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 18. We'll read verses 31 through 34, Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 18. We'll read verses 31 through 34, 31 through 34. Then the Lord Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, mistreated, and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him and the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you. We bow before you. This morning, we thank you for this new Sabbath you have given us. Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. Lord, let the Lord Jesus be exalted in our midst. Holy Spirit God, please speak to us this morning. Father, our bodies are tired. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us the needed concentration. To hear your voice, please help us this morning. Lord, remember me. I pray that you would give me wisdom as I speak your word to your people. Build up your people. In the precious name of Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, I pray. Amen. We had uh, had this wonderful retreat this weekend about the faithfulness of God. And when we do a survey, there are different levels of faithfulness to God between different Christians. Some are more faithful than the others. Right? It's a natural observation. Some are more zealous. Some have more zeal. They are faithful. They are extra sacrificial. Whereas some are behind, we may say, less faithful. Faithful, but less faithful, right? Then we have to ask ourselves this question. What is the reason? What is the reason some seem to be more faithful, some seem to be less faithful? Some may more progress, some make less progress. What is the reason? This morning's portion will give us the answer. What is the reason? And if we get a hold of the reason, then we can, by God's grace, try to avoid that and be faithful to the maximum extent possible. The passage before us, our Lord is revealing to the disciples a third time that he would be going to Jerusalem. We read it verse 31, behold we are going to Jerusalem. And the Lord announces that all things written about him in the Old Testament scriptures will be accomplished. As part of this accomplishment, he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be mistreated. He will be killed. He will rise on the third day. The Lord was saying he was going to voluntarily, willingly 
lay down his life. The Lord was saying, this is my love for you. I know what is going to happen to me. I would be mistreated. I would be mocked. I would be spit upon. My whole body will be pulled apart by the scourging that will happen to me. I will be killed. I know what is going to happen to me. I am going to Jerusalem. The Lord was showing his willingness, his voluntariness to, going, to go to Jerusalem. He was saying, I am giving myself of my own accord. In Galatians 2.20, the apostle says, Christ loved me and gave himself up for me, right? So the Lord is exactly saying the same thing to the disciples. I love you. I am of my own will accord, giving my life for you. The scriptures teach that Christ loved and gave himself up for us. There are so many verses, we don't have time to go through all that. Galatians 2.20 is one of them. It is the Son's love for us. We must not for a minute think the Father did not love us. The Father loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Right? This is the triune God working together of one accord. In 1 John chapter 4, we read this. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Father demonstrating His love, manifesting His love in sending His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is repeated over and over. John 3.16, most of us are familiar. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 3 verse 27. The Father uh, verse 25, the, uh, the Father, the Father's love, whom God displayed pub uh, publicly as a propitiation in His faith, in His blood through faith. God set Him forth. God displayed publicly. His love in giving His Son for us. So the Father loves us according to the scriptures. We must not think somehow the Father is this angry God. And somehow only the Son is this person who is coming, as and, coming and shielding from this angry God. That's a caricature. That's not true. The triune God working together loves us. The Father loves us. In the portion before us, here explicitly is given the Son loving us and willingly going to the cross for us. The Lord was staying. He was going to Jerusalem and all that was written in the Old Testament scriptures would be accomplished. And he's giving six specific things that will happen to him. He will be handed over. He will be given over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked. Means ridiculed. He will be mocked, ridiculed. In the Old Testament scriptures, we read this truth that 
the Lord Jesus would be mocked. The Messiah would be mocked. Turn, turn with me to Psalm chapter 22. Psalm chapter 22. Verse 7. All who see me, Psalm 22, is a commentary of the cross. Psalm 22 describes to us what happened at the cross of Calvary. In the Gospels, if you try to figure out what happened at the cross, you will find very little, little information. The evangelists mostly say they crucified him, that's it, and they move on. But if you really want to know what happened at the cross, you have to read Psalm 22. And one of the things that was happening at the cross is, all who see me sneer at me. All who see me mock at me. Psalm 22 verse 7 is saying that. The Lord Jesus in Luke 18 is saying, this scripture in Psalm 22 is going to happen. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 36, that is exactly what was going to happen. In Luke chapter 23, verse 36, we read this. The soldiers also mocked him, ridiculed him. The Lord said he would be, secondly, he would be mistreated. Luke chapter 18, he would be mistreated. He would be abused. In Isaiah chapter 53, in Isaiah chapter 53, that is exactly what was uh, prophesied. Isaiah chapter 53, we read this. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. By oppression, and judgment, he will be taken away. He will be cut off from the land of the living. He would be oppressed. He would not be judged fairly. His rights would be violated. And that is exactly what the Lord is saying. I would be mistreated. I, my rights would be violated. If you read the gospel, the same gospel, Luke chapter 23, the judge who was presiding over his trial says this. I, verse 4, I find no guilt in this man. Verse 14, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. Behold, I have, uh, behold having examined him before you, he says this second time. I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Verse 22, third time, the judge who was presiding over his case says this, Why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Three times, no sin in him, no guilt in him. What does he say in verse 25? He, uh, the evangelist says, but this judge delivered Jesus to their will, meaning to be crucified. He was mistreated. The Lord said in Luke 18, not only would he be mocked, would he be mistreated, he would be spit upon. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike me, my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Spitting. The Lord is saying in Luke chapter 18, According to the prophets, what, what was prophesied 500 years ago, they are going to do to me that. Read with me, Mark chapter 14, verse 65. 
Mark chapter 14, verse 65. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him. They spat on his face. Verse 33 in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18 says, the fifth thing they will do for him is they will scourge him. Scourging means wounding. In the ancient days, they had this whip that had a bone. It had a sharp piece at, at its end. They were, when they flogged a person, his flesh, this bone would go, hold the flesh. When they pull the whip, that flesh would come apart from the body. There would be a wound. Isaiah chapter 53, same thing. The prophet sees this. He says in verse, he's, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, he says this. He was pierced. He was pierced for our transgressions. The last part of the verse by his stripes, by his wounds, by his scourging. Scourging. Whatever Isaiah says, the Lord is repeating in Luke 18. He's saying, this is what's going to happen to me. Scourging. Mocking, mistreating, spitting, scourging. They will kill him. They will kill him. Isaiah 53 Verse 8, he was cut off out of the land of the living. He was killed, right? That, that's what the prophet Isaiah is seeing. Lastly, the Lord says, he will be killed, and on the third day, he will rise again. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verse 13, the prophet Sees the vision. Behold, my servant will succeed, will prosper. He will be high. He will be lifted up. He will be greatly exalted. So the prophet sees the resurrection, the exaltation, and prophesies that. The Lord saying, after I am killed, I will rise again. Luke chapter 24, you can go home and read. You will see the Lord risen. The Lord risen. The Lord is saying, I am willingly, voluntarily giving myself to this shameful death. I am the creator of the world. I am the king of glory. I am the Lord of glory. I am heaven's darling. I am at my father's bosom. I, the author of life, the one to whom all worship is due, I, going to Jerusalem, I will face all these things. The Lord says, willingly he is doing this. What is the response of the disciples? Verse 34, the disciples understood none of these things. The disciples understood none of these things. And when the Lord was about to be uh, captured, what, what happens to the disciples? They too run away. They too run away. These are the scriptures. Isaiah, 20, uh, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52, Psalm 22. These are scriptures. These people, these disciples have read many, many, many times in their life. The Lord is explaining the scriptures to them. I am the Messiah. All things written in the prophets. Here, 
I'm willingly doing that. I lovingly am doing that. He is giving exposition of the Old Testament scriptures. And what happens? The disciples, they did not understand any of these things. Do you see any parallel while I was trying to enact that? Do you see any parallel? I definitely see parallels for myself. The Lord brings to me the word. He explains to me the word again and again and again. And I, what is my reaction? I understand, I understand not these things. I understand not the things of God. I understand not the love of Christ. And if you're honest with yourself, you would come to the same conclusion. Why do I have less love? I have less love because of this. I understand not the love of Christ. And therefore I am unfaithful. Now, this is not the first time the Lord actually said this to them. This is the third time that he would lay down his life. You read Luke 9, 22 verse, and Luke 9, 44. You would see he said the same things. He's telling them the third time. And they still did not understand. When you and I do not understand the love of Christ, we are unfaithful. Why is it that we don't understand? The Lord gives us the answer. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Verse 25. And the Lord said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. What is the reason the Lord gives to them that they cannot understand? Same reason. We cannot understand too. Foolish men, slow of heart. The Lord is saying, heart is the problem. You and I, we have a heart. Heart doesn't mean in this case the physical heart that pumps your blood, but the essence of our being, this essence of us, our heart is the issue. This heart is foolish. Sin has made it foolish. This heart is slow. It is slow. Turn with me to Luke, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 14. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. After he appeared to the leaven themselves as they were reclining at the table, he reproached them for their unbelief. And, and what did the Lord say after the resurrection? What was their issue? He reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Why do we not understand the things of God? The Lord says the issue is this, the heart. The heart is foolish, the heart is slow, the heart is hard. In Romans chapter 1 verse 24, the apostle says, your, their foolish hearts were darkened. Sin blinds our hearts. Sin darkens our heart. And all of us having this sin in us cannot understand the things of God. It is slow. The writer of Hebrews says, they are, uh, let's turn to write, uh, Hebrews chapter 5. 
here were the Hebrew Christians. He had taught them the gospel faithfully. And this is what he says about them. Hebrews 5, verse 11 and 12. Concerning him, we have much to say. It is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. In other words, he's saying, you are slow of heart. You're spiritually slow. You're in everything else fast. Things of the flesh, you're pretty fast. But in, when it comes to spiritual things, the writer of Hebrews says, you're slow. You're dull of hearing. You ought to be teachers, but you are babes. That's what he says in the next verse. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hardness. Our hearts are hard. When you put a seed on a hard heart, what happens? On hard soil, what happens? Nothing happens, right? It won't do anything. That's what our heart is, right? The writer of Hebrews is giving the illustration of the children of Israel who had come out of Egypt. Verse 8, 9, we read this. Do not harden your hearts as when they, meaning the children of Israel, provoked me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tried me and tested, tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. The writer of Hebrews is saying, children of Israel who came out of Egypt, they came out of 10 plagues. They came out of the Red Sea. God split open the Red Sea. They came to the promised land. They were in the wilderness before they entered the promised land. God brought manna. God brought water from the rock. They saw his works. They saw. Well, what did they do? They tested him. Why did they do that? The hardened heart. Beloved, why do we not understand? Why do we not understand the love of Christ? Our hearts. Even though the same truth is brought over and over and over and over again, why do we need to understand? The heart. The heart is sin. And as long as this heart, this heart is in us, we cannot understand the love of Christ and we cannot be faithful. That's the first reason the Lord says that these disciples could not understand. What is the second reason? And this might startle some of us. And listen carefully. The second reason is this. While the Lord was giving exposition of the, the, the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled in him. He was going to lay his life. They did not understand first because of their heart. Second, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. The meaning of these things was hidden was hidden from them. Because it was hidden, they did not comprehend. Okay, following this, they, it was hidden from them and they did not comprehend. The first reason is because we already read from Luke chapter 24 verse 35, they had a slow heart. They were foolish. That's why they didn't understand. The second reason is it was hidden. The question all of us should ask is, what do you mean? It is hidden means? Does it mean God has hidden it from them? What's the answer? Obviously, we can't say the disciples, it is hidden, they are hiding it, right? That's not what it means. The answer is, God has hidden it. That's the only explanation. Then the next question is, why would God hide it? Why would God hide it? The answer is this. In order to teach humility to us, God hides things. God hides things to teach us 
humility. If we understood things, one of the things that we are all prone to do is this. I am smart. I was able to figure it out. Right? The apostle says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Second Corinthians twelve seven. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. The same principle. Sometimes God. Willingly puts, why? So that we do not boast, we do not exalt ourselves, so that he teaches us humility. The essence of all sin is pride. God in his grace, in his mercy, hides things to keep us from pride, to teach us humility. This morning, there are two reasons why we don't understand. The things of God. First, our own heart, our own sin. Second, the Lord keeps things from us, hides things from us. And as long as we are in these two, we have a slow heart, a foolish heart, a hardened heart. And as long as the Lord hides things from us, we will not understand the love of Christ and we will not be faithful. And all of us this morning should desire to be faithful. And to be more faithful, we must have more love. Why is the apostle so zealous for the Lord, the apostle Paul? He understood this. Christ loved me and gave himself up for me. The more he understood the love, the more he was triggered to serve God. The more faithful he was to God. If you and I are to be faithful to God, we must understand this love at a more deeper level. And if we are to understand this Love at a deeper level, we need to address these two issues. Our heart, we must ask the Lord to reveal. Not hide, but reveal. This morning, if we are to grow in faithfulness, we must understand the love of Christ. And there are three things I want to point before you. I want to put before you this morning. If you are to grow in our love for Christ. First, we must acknowledge the heart of sin. The heart of sin. Many people don't grow because they don't see the depth of sin of their heart. The Pharisee invited the Lord Jesus to his home. He gave a wonderful luncheon, dinner. He was sitting at the table, there was another woman. There was a woman in the town who was a sinner. She comes to the same home. She's sitting not at the table, but at the feet. She is wiping the Lord's feet with her tears. She's washing the Lord's feet with her tears, wiping his feet with her, uh, with her hair. She was kissing his feet. What's the reason? What is the reason why one is sitting at the table, whereas the other is sitting at the feet? The Lord Jesus gives us the answer. Who has forgiven much, loves much. The lady understood her sin. She understood the Savior's love. She understood the depth of her sin, so she loved more. As long as we don't understand the depth of our sin, as long as we don't understand the heart of sin in us, we will never appreciate the cross, the love of Christ on the cross. The first thing we need to realize is, if we are to be loving the Lord, is the depth of sin in our heart. We must understand this. For our spiritual progress, the greatest enemy is ourselves. Let me repeat it. 
for your spiritual progress for my spiritual progress the greatest enemy we have is our own heart of sin yes the devil is an enemy yes the world is an enemy correct i say equal with them our own heart is the enemy and unless this enemy is taken care of we cannot love christ we cannot be faithful to god and how do we take care of this enemy we take care of this enemy by going to our deliverer by going to god in prayer in psalm 18 we read david the king was in great danger he saying the cords of death encompassed me the cords of hell surround me the snares of death confront me that's written for us in verse 4 and 5 what did he do verse 6 in my distress i called upon the lord if we see our heart of sin as our enemy ourselves as our enemy and there is none can who can deliver this is what we would do we in our distress we will cry to the lord lord deliver me from my own self verse 17 you read the rest of the verses god descends from heaven god uh, relieves him from the danger and verse 17 this is what he says he delivered me from my st- that's the first step second thing we said the second thing is god is hiding right god is hiding us uh, hiding from us spiritual things to teach us humility so what do we do we know god is hiding from us so what do we do we ask god not to hide right simple and that's exactly what we need to do we need to ask god later on in this same gospel in luke chapter 24 This is what we read, Luke chapter twenty-four, verse forty-four and fifteen. Uh, Luke chapter twenty-four, verse forty-four and forty-five. These are my words which I speak to, spoke to you while I was still with you, and all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Verse forty-five. So far, they did not understand, right? This is what God did now, the Lord Jesus did now. Then, then. he opened their minds to understand the scriptures he opened the lord christ opened when we see that god is the one who is hiding and when we seek his favor to open our eyes he will open our eyes if we don't ask you you have not because you ask not you are not asking therefore you are not receiving in proverbs chapter 20 we read this wonderful thing proverbs chapter 20 verse 12 we read this proverbs chap- chapter 20 verse 12 the hearing ear the seeing i the lord has made both of them the hearing ear the hearing spiritual ear right the seeing i the i to see spiritual things the i to see the love of christ who makes them the lord makes both of them right the encouragement for us this mo- this morning the lord has to remove the veil so we ask him lord remove the veil that i may see your love that i may understand spiritual things reveal to to me these things by the 
spirit. Psalm 18, verse 28, Psalm 18, verse 28, says this. For you light my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness. The Lord illumines my darkness, so I need to ask him. A wonderful example of this asking is found for us in, the, in Luke chapter 18, in the story of Bartimaeus. What was Bartimaeus' issue? Bartimaeus couldn't see. He was a blind man, right? And what does he do? He sees the Lord was coming that way. He knows he is the son of David. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the God. What does he do? He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He begins to cry out with all of his heart, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people who were there were saying, stop, don't shout, stop, don't shout. What did he do? He shouted all the more. Verse 39, those who led, those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy if you are and I are to know the love of Christ and to be faithful, like Bartimaeus, Lord, have mercy on me. Open your love to me. And this is what the Lord would do. Verse 41. The Lord would ask us this question. What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. I want to see your love. I want to see your love. I want spiritual sight. And that is what the Lord will do for us. Acknowledge your sinful heart. Ask the Lord to deliver you from this powerful enemy of your own heart. Ask the Lord for spiritual vision. The Lord illumines our darkness. Let me give you one more. Be faithful in the things he has taught you. Be faithful in the things He has taught you. You would come to a church or you would re you're reading your Bible. The Lord speaks to you something. Do not treat it lightly. Do not treat that truth as something that is cheap. No, God will not give precious things to those who would treat precious things as cheap things. Be faithful to what he has given you. He taught you a truth. Hold on to the truth. Pray over the truth. Don't take it from this year. Leave it from this year. That's an attitude of, I don't care. Be faithful to the truth he has given you. That shows you are seeking Him. You want to please Him. Every little word He gives, you catch, you hold on to it. You are showing your heart. Lord, I want you. I want to be faithful to you. Seek Him with all your heart. Turn with me to Song of, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Turn with me to chapter 3. The bride. This is what's happening to the bride, meaning you and me. On my bed, night after night, I sought him. I desired him, I sought him, whom my soul loves. This Savior laid down His life for me. My soul loves Him. Therefore, night after night, I sought Him. The bride says, I sought Him, but did not find Him. She was seeking. She was, he, she was not finding. What does she do? 
I must arise now and go about the city. It is night. What is the lady saying? I must arise now, go about the city. In the streets, in the squares, I must seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. Verse 3. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. She couldn't find her lover. She found the watchman. What, did she, what does she do? And I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Have you seen him? She's asking the watchmen who were, uh, who were guarding the city. Have you seen my lover? Have you seen my Solomon? Verse 4. Scarcely had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves. Apparently the watchman told, told, told the lady where he is. Scarcely had I left them, had I left the watch, uh, watchman. She finds her lover. What does she do? When I found him whom my soul loves, I held on to him and would not let him go. I held on to him. I would not let him go. What did she do then? Until I had brought him to my mother's house, into the room of her who conceived me. When she left her lover, uh, when she met her lover, she didn't say, okay, bye-bye, I'll go home. No, she took him. She went home. This should be the attitude for us when we receive things from God. It's not, okay, I found it and let go. No, I found it, I caught it, this is mine. I will take it home, I'll put it in the heart. His love is so precious to me. Many love, not in this way. Not in this way that after holding on to Solomon, she takes him home. When we find the love of Christ, we hold on tight. Everything about him is tight. We take him home. We never leave him. We hold fast. Dear ones, many don't have this attitude. Why would God give something which is precious to people who take it loosely, who don't care? No, no, you wouldn't do that. You shouldn't expect God to do that. Dear ones, if we are to love Christ, we must fight the greatest enemy, our own heart. We must ask God for a new heart. We must ask Him to give light into spiritual things. We must hold fast that which He has given to us. That's when we love Him. When we, as we love Him more, we'll be more faithful to Him. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, this morning we come to You. Lord, uh, the disciples could not understand Your Word, could not understand Your love that You are showing to them, that You were going to offer Your life for them. They did not understand the scriptures give us the reason. It is our own sinful heart. Second reason is you hid it. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace, that you would help us to see our own sinful heart, that we would come to you for the surgery. We pray that you would give us a new heart to love you. Lord, we pray our hearts are darkness. Only you can illuminate our darkness. We pray by your spirit. You would illuminate your word to us. We may understand your love. Lord, we pray that we would not treat your precious truths, Lord, in a light manner, in a callous manner, but we would see them as precious and hold on to them, and we would be faithful to the truths you have revealed to us. Please help us, Lord,
to understand your love. We know in loving you, that is when we can be faithful. So please help us, Lord, in these matters, to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, that we may be faithful to you. We pray these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.